Good morning, Surprise Christian Church. I am very grateful that you guys have joined us this morning on the other side of the screen. Let's get started right away. We're going to the Psalms, Psalm 18. I love to get to read the Psalms over our service. And as Brian said, I cannot wait for the the, the day that is coming very quickly and very soon in which I will read the psalm and everybody will be here in front of me. But I'm glad you're with us on the stream. Psalm 18 this morning. And we're just going to go 1 through 19. We're not going to do the whole psalm because it's a little long. So we're just going to do the first half. It says this. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I was saved from my enemies. The ropes of death were wrapped around me. The torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of Sheol, the the pit or the grave entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. I called to the Lord in my distress and I cried to God for help. And from his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the mountains trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils, and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down, total darkness beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, dark storm clouds his canopy around him. From the radiance of his presence, his clouds swept onward with hail and blazing coals. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High made his voice heard. He shot his arrows and scattered them. He hurled lightning bolts and routed them. The depths of the sea became visible. The foundations of the world were exposed at your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He reached down from on high took hold of me. He pulled me out of deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out to a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Pray with me. Lord, we see this wonderful, fearful, awe-inspiring image of you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, coming down out of heaven to save his people. Lord, as David cried out to you in need, you heard his cries. And Lord, as we cry out to you in need, you hear our cries. And the beauty of this image is that the Lord has come down from heaven. That he did come down to die on a cross. And Lord, I thank you for that. And I look forward to the moment of your return when you come as this image describes in all of your glory and your power with King of kings and Lord of lords tattooed on your thigh, ready to make the world new again. Lord Jesus, I ask as as we face the torrents and the floods of life, that we wouldn't look to ourselves, that we wouldn't look to our friends or our family or our jobs or whatever else it is for security but we would simply cry out to you, Lord, save me. Lord, rescue me. Because you are willing to go to any length to save those you love. And I praise you and I thank you for that truth. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus, the King of the universe, amen. So we are picking back up where we left off in our series as we've been talking about the chain breaker. And and last weekend we took a little bit of a break because I had something I wanted to speak on uh, that was just on my heart. And I I found it actually kind of funny as I was preparing for the sermon this weekend. And when I was sitting with this passage, all of a sudden I realized, 
Lord, this was what was on my heart to preach last week and uh, <laughs> that I preached and I moved it aside and now here it is. So there you go. I, I don't know if this is going to be a repeat in some ways, but it's just the Lord was just like, you should just let me handle it and, and just trusted me that I was, I was moving through. So, so here we are. We're in Matthew. We're in chapter 8. We're in verse 23. But before we read, so I'll tell you guys a little story. When I was... I want to say I was in middle school, I believe. It could have been a little bit older. But I, one of the most traumatic memories that immediately comes to my mind is this particular memory. I was at church camp, and uh, we were in the pool. And I've told you guys stories before about how we would create the whirlpool and things like that. And that was a, that was a great time. This was a different occasion. Uh, we were in the pool, and, and if you've ever hung out with teenagers long enough in a pool type environment, you recognize sometimes how crazy things can be in the things that we decide to do when teenagers decide to do. Anyway, so my friends, we were all having fun and uh, we were, I can't know, I don't know what the game's called, but it's basically where you get on someone else's shoulders and you're wrestling right on top, trying to knock the other person off. I have no clue what that game's called, but uh, Brandy's making motions at me, but it's okay. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> but we were playing that game and we were running around and I, I, I was on one of my friend's shoulders and we were playing and we were wrestling and I fell off backwards and he didn't realize it. And, and, and so it was one of those things where I got under the water right? Because I was just far enough that my head was under water, but I couldn't pull myself up because he was moving. He didn't realize that I had fallen. So he was moving around and, and running. And so I, here I am dragging <laughs> in the water behind, and just water is filling my nose and my lungs and I can't breathe and I'm under the water and I have no way of bringing myself back up. And it, it sticks with me because in, in the moments of my life where I have felt helpless, to change the circumstances. That is one I look back to and I, and I remember fighting and trying to pull myself up and nothing changed. And, and had it continued, had he not noticed, I would have drowned in that situation and had nothing that I could have done to stop it. And it was one of those memories that I go, man, I was that close and since then, I've, I've thought about drowning as probably the most, uh, I, I would prefer not to go out that way. Uh, <laughs> just, that's, that's just where I'll put it. I, I've said to the Lord, hey, listen, I, there's lots of ways to go. Just don't let it be drowning. That, that's just, just not something that I want to experience. It's not on my list. And I'm sure that's true for you. Um, but as an adult, I don't play that game anymore. I don't get on anybody's shoulders to wrestle them in the pool. I end up hurting somebody or hurting myself. There's no question about it. I, I, I don't really swim very often. I don't have a, a very fond memory of public pools and things like that. So, you know, it's not something where I'm going, oh, I might accidentally drown. But, you know, as I've grown older, there's a different type of drowning that I've grown to be afraid of. And I think you know what I'm talking about. The different type of drowning is when the circumstances of your life start to get so out of control that no matter how many things you try to grab and hold on to and how much you fight and how much you kick and how much you scream and how much you try your best to get out from the water, you just seem to be getting deeper and deeper. And every, every time you try to grab to get yourself out, you're just wasting more and more oxygen and nothing's changing. I have a fear of drowning in the weight of life. I have all these things going on. And for me, you guys know, I've got, I've got a brand new baby, Marcella, who I, who I love to death and, and, and I wanna care and be a great father. I wanna be a great husband to my wife. I wanna be a great student. I'm in school several days a week, rolling through my master's degree and finishing that up. I wanna be a great pastor and help manage this church and build this building, which has been one of the most crazy, stressful processes I could ever imagine. And all these things draw and vie for my attention and for my time. And it can very quickly start to feel like you're drowning. When one thing fails, it's something, right? But then when one thing fails and another thing fails and another thing fails and another thing fails in your life, you start to look around and go, I can't fix 
all of these things. I can't plug enough of the holes in the boat to get the water to stop pouring in. So maybe you're like me. <laughs> and maybe a lot of the times in life, you feel like you are drowning. The water's pouring in and you have no way to stop it. I want to hit this idea today. It's very simple. When you feel like you're drowning, have faith. When you feel like you're drowning, have faith. You see, the psalm we just read is a beautiful psalm of how David is crying out to God in the circumstances of his life. <laughs> and he describes them as torrents, right? These waves of destruction. And he cries out to God and he says that God hears him. But I want you to notice that in that psalm, it's not just like God hears him and then snaps his fingers and then everything's okay. The whole picture is God coming down from heaven to rescue David. He hears his prayers and then there's this magnificent, awe-inspiring, fearful picture of God coming on the darkness and throwing lightning bolts. I mean, it's just this amazing picture. And what is all that for? To rescue David. David to rescue his people. That is how God looks at you and me when he comes to rescue us. And he, he's already done that in the cross and he will return again. But when we are drowning, the thing to do is not to figure it out ourselves, but to cry out to God, save me. I don't have it. I can't do it. Save me. We're going to read Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 23. And, and I just want you to have this simple idea of when you're drowning, have faith in your mind as we read this. So let's do it together. Verse 23. So this is right after last week, right? As Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Suddenly a violent storm arose on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. I love this. And in my Bible, there's like a little dash mark that separates this line, and I love that. I think that's great. It was being, the boat's being swamped by the waves, but Jesus kept sleeping. <laughs> that might be my favorite verse in the entire, honestly, it really, really might. I love it. Verse 25. So the disciples came and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're going to die. That's me, man, if I'm on that boat, let me tell you. He said to them, why are you afraid? You have little faith. And he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men were amazed, and they asked, what kind of man is is this, even the winds and the sea obey him. Let's go through this verse by verse and just take a deeper look. So what's the first thing we see? Verse 23, as he got into the, the, boat, the boat, his disciples followed him. I want to stop for a minute because this is actually a really important part of the story. And it may not seem like it on the surface, but but remember what we preached and talked about two weeks ago, right? So we had that little break in between. But two weeks ago, we were in this passage right before. I'm just going to read it very quickly. In verse 18, it says, When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea, right? So this is still in that context. Jesus was saying, we're going to the other side of the sea, right? And a scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. You remember that? And I, to and I told you guys, this guy sees his chance, right? Jesus is like, we're going to the other side of the sea. This guy's like, I want to look good. Teacher, I'll go wherever. I'll follow you wherever. Don't worry, Jesus, I got your back. And Jesus says, foxes have dens and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Lord, another of his disciples said, first, let me go bury my father. That's a little bit more serious, right? But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And then the next verse is the start of our story. And he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Do you notice the contrast here? There are these disciples who are coming to Jesus and saying, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus challenges that. And in the end, the, the, the few of his 
disciples actually go into the boat with Jesus and follow him. Do you see that? I don't want you to miss that in the story. That's really, really important because what it does is it sets up the whole scene. You see, this isn't just the people on the fringe. This isn't just that scribe trying to look good. This is the inner circle getting in the boat with Jesus after he had already made clear, hey, following me is not sunshine and rainbows and roses. It is a hard path because you're gonna have to suffer what I suffer. And these guys said, I'm following anyway. And they get in the boat, okay? So these disciples are devoted They're dedicated. They have chosen Jesus and they said, the path you're going, however hard it is, I'm with you. That's so important to this story. And I hope you're already starting to see why, right? Because verse 24 hits. Suddenly, (laughs) I love that word, out of nowhere, out of the blue, right? It It was bright blue skies when they got in the boat. Now they're in the middle of the sea. And this does happen, by the way, and that's part of the fear of drowning when you're on a boat, is that all of a sudden a storm does just out of nowhere kick up. And so they're in the sea and suddenly a violent storm arose. This isn't just any storm. This is a violent storm. You see, I, my family, I've told you guys this before, our, our vacation of choice is a cruise and a cruise goes all the way out in the middle of the ocean, right? I could tell you, <laughs> tied to my fear of drowning, There was one time we were on a cruise ship and we were getting pretty close to the dock and we were going to dinner because you go to dinner at night, of course, and they have these fancy dining rooms and there's all this stuff going on. Anyway, so I lost track of where we were. When I went into the dining room, we were still out in the middle of the ocean, okay? And, And I knew we were on our way to port, but I didn't know how close it was. And so we're sitting down for dinner and we're eating for a while. Well, all of a sudden, and I really mean out of nowhere, the boat starts to do this. And you know, sometimes that happens, a wave hits you and then you go back. It didn't go back. It kept doing this and it kept doing this and it kept doing this. And literally it got so sideways that the waders started to fall off the ground and started to slide down the ground. The table started to fly over. We started to slide down towards the bottom of the boat. The boat was tipping over all the way into the sea, like literally tipping over, just out of nowhere. And I had this moment in my mind, and I went, God, you're not funny. (laughs) The one thing I asked was not to die by drowning, and this boat is tipping, and, and this is a real Titanic situation. Well, as I thought it had reached the point of no return, suddenly, and it corrects and flips back to the other side. What had happened was, the, the ship captain was a rookie. He had never done this before and he was trying to park in the, the dock at the, the, the bay there and he mistimed it and hit the side and tipped the boat and almost tipped the whole boat over. And just at the last minute was able to save it and rescue it and pull it back. It was one of those moments where I, I <laughs> you start to live a movie, right? And, and the world goes into slow motion. That's the picture Verse 24, suddenly, it's out of nowhere. All of a sudden, this boat is getting tipped over and these guys are going, we are going to drown. And it says right there, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. It's that situation where you're in a boat, but you feel like you're in the ocean because the water's up to your knees, right? That's a bad feeling. And all this is happening, right? But Jesus kept sleeping. I don't want us to miss that. I don't want us to miss that, you see, because this storm is not by accident. This storm is not just something that happened. God is in control of the winds and the waves and the sea. And God, whether these disciples recognize it in this moment, is in the boat with the disciples. Jesus is laying in the boat. And on one end, his humanity certainly is asleep in the boat. But on the other hand, he's still God. He's still the creator of the universe. He's still in control of the winds and the waves and the sea. 
I love the picture going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. I want to just read it very quickly. And then I'm going to go to another passage in the New Testament. But Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, it says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. There's this amazing picture of God being over this this chaotic, dark sea. God is in control of the sea. And in Revelation chapter four, verse six, it talks about how in the new heavens, there's a sea as still as glass. And the picture is that God's in complete control in heaven. Well, in Colossians chapter one, I wanna go there very quickly. The same image that's drawn in Genesis is applied to Jesus. In Colossians chapter one, in verse 15, it says this, talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And hear this, folks, and by him, all things hold together. You see, Jesus is not just the creator of the universe, but he sustains it. Every molecule in your body that that makes up your body at this very moment, the only reason you don't just collapse into nothing is because Jesus himself is holding the very molecules of your body together at this very moment. Every single bit of creation is held together like glue by Jesus himself, by his power. There is nothing in the world, not the grounds you step on, not the air you breathe, not the body you inhabit that is not held together by Jesus. That's who we're talking about. He's in the boat with the disciples in the story. So let's go back to it. A violent storm arose in the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus is still sleeping. He kept sleeping. Jesus is the one who sends the storm. And it's going to be an important storm for a reason here. So the disciples, verse 25, came and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to die. And you see, one of the reasons I wanted you to know that this was the chosen few, that this was the devoted disciples, that these were the ones who said, despite all the warnings, I'm going to follow you no matter what, is because when we read this, sometimes we go, psh, those disciples and we, and we start to think to ourselves that we can speak with Jesus when he says to the next verse, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? But I want to challenge you. If you're feeling in your heart, I could tell them, you of little faith. Why, why are you afraid? You're in there with Jesus. What's wrong with you? You're not doing very good self-reflection. You're not doing very honest self-reflection. The truth is, you and I, are these disciples, if we're, you know, privileged and honor enough to be as devoted and dedicated as they are in this moment. Lord, save us. We're going to die. That's the cry. That's what I began with this morning, and that's the thought. You see, because Jesus' next line makes us think that the disciples had no faith, but that's not what he says. What he says is you of what? Little faith. You see, because you have to have some faith to cry out to Jesus in the middle of the storm as you're about to drown, Lord, save us. They recognized at least enough of who Jesus was to recognize that he could save them from this storm. 
If you're just in there with another teacher, another rabbi, another whoever, you're not thinking to yourself, yeah, this guy can stop the storm. They don't just wake Jesus up up and say, hey, we're about to die. They say, Jesus, save us. Lord, save us. Because we're about to die. We're going to die. That is faith. That is faith. That's belief that Jesus can change the circumstances they're about to face. And I love Jesus' response. I don't hear this in anger. You might read it in anger. I don't read this in anger. Verse 26, and he said to them, why are you afraid? You have little faith. That's not anger. He's asking him a question. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know who I am? And he got up, and he does what? He tells the winds and the waves to stop. He rebukes them. And there was a what? A great calm. You see, friends, there was a sudden, violent storm. And all it took was Jesus' word. And now there is a great calm. And the men are amazed. (laughs) <laughs> and they ask Jesus, or they ask each other, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. And that gets us to our point. When you feel like you're drowning, have faith. And what does it look like to have faith? What it looks like to have faith is to cry out to the Lord, save us. We're going to die. And you might say, well, I don't want to have little faith. I want to have a lot of faith. I want to be so confident that I don't even ever have to say, Lord, save us. We're going to die. And I understand that and I get that heart. But you have to understand that as a human being, I'm sorry, but the only faith we're ever going to amount to is a little one. (laughs) It's a little one. It's a little one that says to the Lord, Jesus, Save us, we're going to die. But it's one that knows that Jesus can save. They can do it. And we only have to remind ourselves of who he is. And the world can become a great calm. When you feel like you're drowning, have faith. So how do we live it out? Here's the first thing. It's the big piece. We must recognize who Jesus is. You see, in this process, as we have gone through all of this building stuff, um, you know, just the trials and the tribulations of COVID and everything else that we faced, not just as a church, but personally, I've certainly felt on many occasions this moment of just, I can't do it, as I expressed last weekend. And what has always gotten me through is is looking to Jesus and reminding myself, who is it that I follow? Who is it that I worship? Who is it that I pray to? Who is it that I praise? Who is it that I follow every single day? It's Jesus. And who is he, the creator, what we read in Colossians, the creator, the sustainer of the entire universe? And I am certain that if the Lord can hold the very molecules that make up my body together this morning, if he can hold the universe which has galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies of stars beyond any imaginable number of being able to count, if God can control the winds and the waves of the ocean, if God can control all of that and create all of that and hold all of that together, and at this very moment, the only reason all of that exists is by Jesus' power, and that's the God I worship. I have to say to myself, Jesus' words to the disciples, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? And after you walk away from that massive view of who Jesus is, 
There is no reasonable answer to the question, why are you afraid? Because you know, if Jesus is who he says he is, I have nothing to fear. And that goes right into the second piece. We have to recognize the power that God has over everything in our lives. There is nothing that slips through the hands of God. There is nothing that he looks and goes, whoops, missed that one. Whoops, I let that happen. I I shouldn't have done that. Whoops, uh, uh, this wasn't what I want. I didn't turn out. I I can't do anything about it. I guess I just got to let it be. There's nothing that slips through the hand of God. If God is holding your very molecules together at this moment, what could possibly be beyond him? We have to be able to look at God and recognize you have all power, all authority on heaven and on earth. And then we get to this. It's the simplest thing of all. We cry out to God. Lord, save us. We're going to die. You see, because you may not feel the weight of drowning in the circumstances of your life, but there's something I have to assure you of. Life is much like this storm, where all of a sudden you're out on the sea and everything's great. And then (laughs) the boat starts tipping, right? And then the water starts tipping filling and then there's not enough buckets to paddle out the water to to stop it from filling and whether you realize it or not whether you feel like you've got it all together I promise you at this very moment the truth is that whether it's physically or spiritually you without Jesus are drowning you are drowning and even as Christians We can feel the weight of the world and we can start to recognize I'm drowning. (laughs) And I don't want my message to be so find a paddle (laughs) or find a bucket or get in a bigger boat or, 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 or just start getting some duct tape. That's not the message. The message isn't try to figure out more things you can do to make it better. Or let me, let me, let me get it all. I got it. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to put the piece together. I'm going to plug the holes. I got this. The life of faith is a life that looks to Jesus and says, Lord, save me. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't have it. I don't have it spiritually. I don't have it physically. I don't have it mentally. I don't have it emotionally. I don't have it with my family. I don't have it with my friends. I don't have it with my church. I don't have it with my job. I don't have it with anything. Save me. And the beautiful thing goes back to our song. When we recognize who Jesus is, when we recognize the power that he has, and we simply resign ourselves to him and say, Lord, save us, what's the picture we get in that psalm? God himself, in all his glory, comes to rescue. And we know it's true because we've seen it before. God coming down from heaven, dying on a cross for us, raising from the dead, ascending to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. God has already come to rescue us. And if only we would cry out to him, Lord, save us every day until he returns. I promise you, if we don't do that, we're gonna drown. If we do do that, the life that you will live is a life of peace and joy in Christ. Pray with me. God, you are so good. If I have a prayer this morning, Lord, it's simply this. Humble us. Those on the other side of the camera this morning who feel in their hearts that they have it together, I ask that you humble them. 
Lord, when I allow that thought to creep into my heart that it's up to me, I'm gonna pull it together, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna get it done, I'm gonna put my, pull my bootstraps up, I'm gonna solve the problem. Humble me, Lord. Cause the storm, as you did with the disciples, the chosen few. Get me close to the fear of drowning so that I might recognize who you are are and who I am and that I need you and you alone and when I forget and I think I have it all together I stray further and further from the Lord I love and for those today Lord who feel they're drowning God I ask you to put the voice in their mouth the strength enough to say, Lord, save me, for I'm going to die. Because I know that you are good. And you will answer the call. God, I love you. I thank you for your son. I trust you with everything I have. I pray this in the name of the king of the universe, Jesus Christ. Amen.